if this was just an insulin problem, then high levels of insulin, like if this was just an issue where the cells aren't as responsive to insulin, so we can just provide more insulin to get the same level of response. If that's all it was, then just increasing insulin would fix all of the pathology. We wouldn't see any further issues. Everything would be normal. And obviously, based on this paper, we're not seeing that. We're not seeing that it's able to restore the normal glucose oxidation, even though it does, as you said, lower lipid oxidation, which is, as we'll get to, uh, you know, is a bit of a preview, one of the reasons why insulin is actually helpful in the state, uh, one of its benefits, and one of the main ways that it's restoring function to an extent, it's not actually fixing the oxidative problem where the cells still can't use the glucose entirely or as much, but it's fixing one of the contributors to that, which is the lipid oxidation. I want to add one quick thing and then I'll jump into the next study. So the quick thing I wanted to add was the, the confusion I think is mostly semantics, right? So it's like people talk about insulin resistance, but the problem is more so inability to oxidize glucose effectively. Totally. So it, like instead of calling it insulin resistance, we could well we should just create some other fancy name talking about impaired glucose oxidation as the central function of diabetes and insulin resistance kind of just being like the secondary factor on the side because this study is showing that it exactly that it's, it does the insulin is irrelevant in all of the states you're seeing impaired glucose oxidation and it's shunting towards lactate and in an upregulation on on fatty acid oxidation and it, this also is directly flies in the face of the idea of metabolic flexibility where burning more fats makes you more metabolically flexible you're seeing here that the their reliance on fatty acid oxidation and the inflexibility the inability to oxidize glucose right that that's contributing there uh, the yes. increased lipid oxidation yeah definitely definitely and and yeah maybe we'll i mean it would be great to start to rename it because i do think you're right calling it insulin resistance is entirely a misnomer and it should be called impaired glucose metabolism. But you know, I guess it, it would just take a little while to catch on and nobody would know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. you want to... Yeah, I'll jump into the next study. So the next study here uh, further accentuates the point that we were talking about in the previous study and starts to look at what's going on specifically in the glycolytic enzymes. And then the... So those are the enzymes that control glycolysis and glycolysis, uh, glycolysis and lactate acid, uh, lactic acid production. And then the other ones would be the enzymes involved in the electron transport chain in the Krebs cycle that would oxidize glucose fully versus and produce all the ATP instead of just the two ATP that you get from lactate production. So the study is titled Altered Glycolytic and Oxidative Capacities of Skeletal Muscle Contribute to Insulin Resistance and Non-Insulin Dependent Diabetes Mellitus. So I'm going to read a series of quotes here uh, and I'll, I'll define things as we go along. So the first thing they say here is the insulin resistance of skeletal muscle in glucose tolerant obese individuals is associated with reduced activity of oxidative enzymes and a disproportionate increase in activity of glycolytic enzymes. So if you remember the, if you remember kind of the graphic or if you have any idea, or if you guys want to pull up and see a graphic of glycolysis versus, uh, uh, oxidative phosphorylation or cell respiration. Glycolysis is a whole, is a piece of cell respiration, but with glycolysis, you take glucose, you produce pyruvate, and then that pyruvate has to go into the Krebs cycle and the citric, the citric acid cycle, produce the NADH, and then that goes to the, to the electron transport chain, and then you produce a bunch of ATP. So what they're trying to see here is in the, in, in the, these individuals is what's going on in the electron transport chain and Krebs cycle and what's going on in glycolysis. And what they're saying here is that in obese individuals, you're seeing that the enzymes inside the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain have reduced activity. And then the enzymes in glycolysis in obese individu individuals have an increased activity. So you're seeing this, this lowering of ability to oxidize glucose effectively. And then this increased ability of running glucose through glycolysis. So, Next thing they go here to say, they say activity for glycolytic enzymes, the enzymes being phosphofructose kinase, glycerolaldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase, and hexokinase was highest in, subject, in subjects with uh, non-insulin dependent diabetes myelitis following the order of the worst. So the order they're giving us is the worst was the non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. So the diabetics had the highest amount of glycolytic enzymes with the lowest amount of the oxidative enzymes. Then it was the obese the obese population, the obese population was worse than the diabetic population, again, with higher glycolytic enzymes and then the lower oxidative enzymes. And then the lean individuals were on the flip side where they actually had 
good function of their oxidative enzymes, but poor function of their glycolytic enzymes. And then they continue to say here, so whereas maximum velocity for oxidative enzymes, so they have citrate synthase and cytochrome C oxidase. We've talked about cytochrome C oxidase before and being involved in the electron transport chain. They say it was lowest in subjects with uh, non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. So what you can kind of see here is a spectrum. Diabetes is the worst where they have the highest amount of ox uh, glycolytic enzyme function. So that's running glycolysis. That's pushing towards lactate. And the low. And the reason I'm saying pushing towards lactate is because their oxidative enzymes are really low. So the, the Krebs cycle electron transport chain not working too well. Gly glycolysis working kind of all right. Um, and then the, in, the obese individuals, again, they're in the middle. They're not working as well as lean individuals for their oxidative enzymes, but their glycolytic enzyme function is higher. And then you have all the way on the other side, the lean individuals, oxidative enzymes are working well. And then the glycolytic enzymes are, are also working well, but the oxidators aren't shut down with this compensatory increase in the glycolytic enzymes. So what they continue to say here is they say the ratio between glycolytic and oxidative enzyme activities within skeletal muscle correlated negatively with insulin sensitivity. So what does that mean? The higher glycolytic enzyme function and lower oxidative enzyme activity you have in skeletal muscle, the more insulin resistant you are. So the worse your insulin sensitivity is. Whereas on the flip side, if your oxidative enzyme function is good and your glycolytic enzyme function, it's not elevated, but it's still functioning, then insulin sensitivity is great. So what they, what they wrap up here and they say, in summary, an imbalance between glycolytic and oxidative enzyme capacities is present in non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus subjects and is more severe than obese or lean glucose tolerant subjects. The altered ratio between glycolytic and oxidative enzyme activities found in skeletal muscle of individuals with non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus suggests that a dysregulation between mitochondrial oxidative capacity and capacity for glycolysis is an important component of the expression of insulin resistance. So what they're saying here is the core component of insulin resistance is not this. They're not even talking about insulin. They're talking about the the oxidative enzymes, the enzymes that take that pyruvate from glycolysis and run it through the Krebs cycle and then, and then the electron transport chain and produce all this ATP, that's not working in diabetics. At the worst, the, the obese glucose tolerant people are kind of in the middle and then the lean people, things are working well. So the, the central dysfunction is this metabolic dysfunction. And it's not, it, this is nothing even talking about insulin specifically. This is talking about what's going on centrally in the mitochondria in the cell, which is what the key point that we're talking about inside the bioenergetic perspective is that insulin resistance is a problem with energy production in the mitochondria of the cell. And then all the things that happen beyond that or upstream are, are consequences of this central problem first. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's all relatively clear there essentially what's going on is the cells are not effectively using glucose so they have to rely more on glycolysis instead of as you said Krebs cycle electron transport chain in terms of their usage of glucose they have to rely on glycolysis to produce energy and then also lipid oxidation fat utilization so if somebody were to say that you know there's like we're oxidizing glucose in or we're using glucose as a fuel in type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance there is again it is mostly like we're not using it more than fat. We're using fat considerably more in this state. And when we are using glucose, we're using it extremely inefficiently. That's not a cause. That's an effect, right? We're seeing that it, that is a state where we can't effectively use the glucose uh, through the oxidative mechanisms to produce energy. And as we had said in that first study, just to go back to it, in a normal state where there's not high glucose and there's not high insulin, the in type 2 diabetes this is also reduced like glycolysis is also reduced because there's also reduced glucose uptake so there's all these compensatory mechanisms to try to increase atp production but the mitochondria are so broken so to speak that it, those compensatory mechanisms just involve a lot of poor efficiency respiration uh and and so yeah it's it's almost like Again, trying to bring in some analogies here to make it clear. Like if we're in, in a car, it's like we're stuck in first gear, right? Like you can keep revving the engine and get a little bit faster, but you're really inefficient in terms of your 
you fuel usage and you're really not getting that much output and you're going to be creating a lot more exhaust and things like that. And I don't know if those things are necessarily that true, but you know, let's assume that that's the case in a, in a car and someone who knows cars really well can correct us, but uh, <laughs> we're not <laughs> it, mechanics, <laughs> right? Yeah. That'll be a different podcast for the future. <laughs>